All right, let's get to our big story now. A lot of us make mistakes as teenagers. At that age, it's pretty much par for the course. But for most of us, we can put our mistakes behind us. Frankly, they weren't that bad. They weren't that big. For some, that's not the case. For some, mistakes made as teenagers alter the course of their lives and the lives of others. So should people who do something terrible young, like commit a violent crime, even murder, get a second chance? That's the question that Oregon lawmakers are taking up as we speak. So here is tonight's big story researched and written by KGW producer Ashley Koch. She was uh, an amazing sister. We were 13 months apart, so we were like grew up best friends as well as sisters. It's been 29 years since Lorna Flormo's sister, Lisa, was killed. In 1991, a teenager broke into her house and stabbed her 17 times in the neck. And then, you know, all the details started coming in about, you know, that this 16-year-old boy had nearly decapitated her with a, with a dull Boy Scout knife um, um, after he had attempted to, to rape her. Her killer, Todd Davila, was just 16 years old when he was convicted. Davila is currently serving a 50-year sentence for murder, but that could soon change. He's one of 73 people who could have their sentences commuted under an order passed by Oregon Governor Kate Brown. So how did we get here? In 1994, Oregon passed Measure 11. It imposed mandatory minimum sentences for violent crimes like assault, rape, and murder. It also required kids 15 and older who are charged with these crimes to automatically be tried as adults. Fast forward to 2019. Senate Bill 1008A, having received a constitutional majority, is declared passed. When the Oregon legislature passed Senate Bill 1008, a bipartisan bill that dropped that trial requirement, it also allowed some people who were convicted as teens to get a second look at their sentence once they've served half of it or a parole hearing after 15 years. But that bill wasn't retroactive, so people sentenced before it passed didn't have a chance at early release. That is, until now. Governor Brown's commutations mean that 73 prisoners will now get that chance. Where they can prove that they're not the, not the same person that they were as a kid, that the kids changed, that they've changed, um, and that they're, they're ready to be released. The youth sentencing reforms come with new research into the way teens' brains work. Brain science is basically, you know, adolescents and young adults is the... The back part of our brain is connecting to the front part of our brain. In that connecting phase, we call adolescence. That's where impulsivity, that's where thrill seeking is at its peak. And that's often what's behind a lot of our um, in the moment situations that have gotten our young people in trouble. The governor said in a statement, youth should be held accountable for their actions. But the fact is that adolescent brains are still growing and developing, especially in skills such as reason, planning and self-regulation. Yet too often, our criminal justice responses do not take this into account. In particular, she went on to say, Measure 11 removed any routes for young people to demonstrate their capacity for change and positive growth. When teens are convicted in Oregon, they go into the Oregon Youth Authority system until they're 25 serving times at places like McLaren Youth Facility with structure they may not have had in their lives before. Uh, there's, there's a schedule seven days a week, meaning that we get them up probably around 6.30 in the morning, 6.15-ish. Dr. Nick Satello says most of these kids are coming from traumatic backgrounds. A common theme is you've had kids that have had to fend for themselves. But he believes they can go on to be healthy members. So it's it's remarkable to be to be honest. And so we do see kids um, that turn into young men uh, ready to take on whatever the next phase of their life is gonna is gonna bring to them. And that's really what brings people like me back. I've been doing this for 22 years. Now, we can't talk about youth sentencing without mentioning Kip Kinkle. He was 15 years old when he killed his parents and two classmates at Thurston High School in Springfield in 1998. He also injured 25 others in that school shooting. Jessica Schulberg spent months interviewing Kinkle for The Huffington Post, learning about the mental health struggles he was experiencing before that shooting. He walked us through the first time he started hearing voices as a kid and sort of the paranoia that that led him to experience. 
Kinkle's name comes up every time youth sentencing reforms are discussed. Schulberg said Kinkle talked to her because of the way his name was being used to keep other people locked up. He was seeing how they were being denied a second chance because every time there was some type of reform measure that would come up, people would say, oh, we can't pass that or Kip Kinkle will get out of prison. To be clear, Kinkle is excluded from the new reforms. He will not be able to petition for release under Governor Brown's new order because of his 112-year sentence. For those 73 prisoners whose sentences could be commuted, the governor's office says they're reviewing those right now and no decisions will be made until December or January. It's very likely many of these uh, offenders will uh, receive parole. Many prosecutors are not happy about this, like Chris Owen with the Clackamas County District Attorney's Office. You have to keep in mind, these are the worst of the worst offenders. These are not property offenders. These are not drug dealers. Uh, If you were to go through the list, it's all crimes like it's murder, it's attempted murder, it's rape, it's sodomy. Lorna Flormo is also not happy. Where's where's Lisa's second chance? She doesn't get a second chance. She was... She was young, too. She did. She didn't. You know, she was 22 years old. She didn't get to live her life. She doesn't buy the argument that her sister's killer was too young to understand what he was doing. The types of risks that are normal for a teenage brain are not using a pocket knife to decapitate someone. To use a dull pocket knife to cut through a person's neck almost to the point that their head is not attached anymore. How does one, that's not, I just, I can't imagine how someone rehabilitates from something like that. There's something really, really wrong in that person's head. And that's a huge risk. Flormo fears what will happen if Davila or other people convicted of violent crimes are released. And if those people like Todd Davila get out and they do something in the community, if they hurt people again, that's on Governor Brown's shoulders. And I would say that to her face. I just, it's really, really disturbing. Again, that piece was researched and written by KGW producer Ashley Koch. Now, tomorrow on Straight Talk, Laurel Porter will also be focusing on these juvenile offender commutations. She's speaking with Gabe Newland from the Oregon Justice Resource Center, who you just heard from in that piece. She's also talking to Marion County District Attorney Paige Clarkson. That airs tomorrow at 7 p.m. on KGW.